Oh, all right. <laughs> I'd like to introduce you to our next speaker, to our speaker for this particular concurrent session. This is Alice Scott, my dear friend, my beloved colleague, and person who I've worked with for many, many years. And Alice is going to talk about something she knows very, very well, which is copyright and digitizing things. I can't add any more words to somebody who <laughs> doesn't need an introduction. Alice. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> My beloved colleague, Andrew Wilhelm. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. I hope that you're all wide awake because we are going to talk about copyright today, and you will listen. Those of you who know my secret identity from last night, <laughs> for those of you who don't, well, we'll talk about that later. No inside jokes today. Okay, well, anyway, copyright is one of those things that everybody talks about nobody knows about. Everybody, everybody in libraries needs to know about it. So, it's a brave new world. It's a brave new world in copyright. And... Copyright law can be very much like this image, walking a tightrope. We, uh, we have to follow the law, but we can't let it discourage us. We can't let us, it discourage us or strangle our creativity. That's the one thing I want to get across to you today. This is one reason why it's important to understand copyright law, so that we can make reasonable assumptions about how we're going to deal with any copyright issues that might come up. And especially when we're going to make things available on the internet, or we might be using things from the internet, you know, the law is still kind of evolving a little bit there. So here's my important disclaimer. I am not a copyright expert. I am not a lawyer. Anything we talk about today, if you have really serious questions, you must consult your legal counsel because I am not a substitute for that. What we're going to do today is we are going to look at copyright, we're going to cover the basics, and we're going to talk about some specific instances and how you can avoid infringing co on copyright. So um, this is necessarily a very brief overview, obviously, because we've only got, what, an hour. So. Um, there's no simple recipe, though, for identifying and resolving the questions and issues that are related to using protected works. That's where the problem lies. So, anyway, feel free to stop me and ask questions if you, if you so desire. That's not a problem. I'm going to be looking at my notes a lot because there's a lot of stuff that I want to cover, and I tend to digress sometimes, and then I get off topic and then I think, did I say everything I wanted to say to these people? Oh my gosh, there's an important fact that I left out. So uh, I hope you will forgive me for looking at my notes so much. Okay. Sam Clements here, you might know him as Mark Twain, had this to say about copyright over a hundred years ago. In 1902 he said this. Well today, over a hundred years later, things haven't gotten much better, have they? <laughs> And curiously, Sam here was a big proponent himself of more and longer copyright terms. I find that interesting, but I still agree with this statement. In the beginning, copyright began in England with the Statute of Anne in 1710. Queen Anne, that is. This is the first copyright act in the entire world. You know, you would think that it would have been the Germans, because that's my people, and we're very anal retentive, you know, at least in my family we are. And this would have been something that we would have developed. But Queen Anne developed this. Um, this so this is the British Statute of Anne from 1710. It's just a little facsimile that I got from the British Library. And I would like to mention here, at the end of this presentation, I have a slide with credits where I got everything. <laughs> Always give credit where credit is due. So this is an act for the encouragement of learning by vesting the copies of printed books in the authors or purchasers of such copies during the times therein mentioned. Now, the first copyright law in the United States was in 1790. It was an act for the encouragement of learning. 
isn't that really so much better? I like that. It granted the authors of Maps, Charts, and Books, they were specifically mentioned, the exclusive right to print, publish, or vend their works. Now, this uh, image is from the um, 1998 Copyright Term Extension Act, otherwise known as the Sonny Bono Copyright <laughs> Term Extension Act. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I may be mentioning more about that later. <clears throat> but anyway, so the purpose of copyright law, it's to benefit the public by, and I quote from the law, advancing the progress of science and the useful arts. Now, what do you think that means? I don't know, but it sounds good. According to the U.S. Constitution, 1787, copyright is to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times. I want you to remember that phrase. Limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. So it's a monopoly, yes. It's a limited one, but it's governed by statute. Copyright, therefore, is a form of protection provided by the laws of the United States to the authors of original works of authorship. Well, isn't that government doublespeak the original authors of works of authorship. So anyway, it protects published and unpublished literary, scientific, and artistic works, whatever the form of expression, provided such works are fixed in a tangible form. What do I mean by tangible? If you can see it, you can hear it, you can feel it, it's tangible. It's protected. The fixation need not be directly perceptible, as so long as it can be communicated with the aid of a machine or device, which means email, websites. Okay? We can't touch them, but we can see them, we can hear things on them. Okay, so what laws in the United States actually govern copyright? Well, we have in the Constitution, we have Article 1, Section 8 which says that the Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science and the useful arts, as I said on the earlier slide. Okay, so this statement implies to us then that the intention of copyright law is to foster creativity, foster creativity, make it more important, encourage creators to share their works, share their works. Well, it doesn't always work that way, but it encourages them, encourages them to share their works for the betterment of society. While at the same time, though, allowing them to profit from their work. Of course, we don't want them to not get paid for their work. So Congress interprets the Constitution and produces law that's embodied in the U.S. Code, and Title 17 is where that lives, where the copyright, the current U.S. Copyright Act lives in Title 17. And it is the only, it is really only the latest of several iterations. You know, it, it keeps changing over the years, as we'll see. So, for example, um, photography was not a protected medium in the copyright law until the 1870s. And movies were not protected until the turn of the century, even though they existed. Both of those existed prior to that time. So, a lot of projects that I've worked with address these sort of historical collections and things. And... Many of the things that you all are doing as well are going to be creating things that you're putting on the internet. So you need to be aware of how, you have to have some basic familiarity with the current copyright law. If you have historical materials, you need to be familiar with the copyright law, uh, the Copyright Act of 1909. I mean, it's really, there's a lot of things. So the rules, though, for calculating the duration of copyright differ. And we'll have, uh, you'll see later that there are different results depending on what kind of materials you have. You probably all know that these are the main things, these are the things that are protected by copyright. But, amazingly enough, 
Not everything can be protected by copyright. Works created by U.S. government employees, these are considered works for hire in the course of their employment, I mean. These are considered works for hire. So our tax dollars have already paid for these works, so these people cannot claim copyright on them. Um, in the state of Illinois, generally works created by the state of Illinois, government publications in, in Illinois are also not copyrighted. Although there are some, I have seen Illinois documents that are copyrighted, but in general they're not. So works consisting entirely of information that is common property containing no authorship. Factual things, you know, like telephone books, for instance. It's factual information. Titles, names, short phrases, slogans, symbols, designs. These are the kind of things, this is intellectual property, yes but it's a different kind. It, it is not protected by copyright. It can be under trademark or patent laws, a lot of these things. Ideas, procedures, methods, those things can't be copyrighted. They might be able to be patented, however. Works in the public domain, of course, these are works that have their copyrights expired. And then works that have not been fixed in a tangible form of expression like improvisational speeches, for instance. Like this. Except that it's really not improvisational, is it? <laughs> it's also being fixed. Yes, it is. <laughs> so, as I said, copyright exists in the United States from the, from the moment it is fixed in a tangible form of expression. So an author can be a sculptor, a painter, a photographer, a writer, anybody who creates anything. And as an author or a creator, you have five basic rights. We control, as, a, as an author, you control the reproduction and copying of that item, the public display, the public performance, the public distribution, and the creation of derivative works from your, from your copyrighted work. I made this from, at this wonderful site, henameal.com. It's just lovely. I just, yeah, I just really like this image myself, <laughs> and I thought it fit really well here. So, anyway, um, <clears throat> so if things are, the derivative works are things that are, you might transform or adapt from an original thing, and I have some examples of derivative works later. Now, here are some important points that you want to keep in mind. Copyright protects the actual expression of an idea, but not the idea itself, as I said earlier. Since the United States joined the Berne Convention in 1989, copyright, copyright notice of any type is not required on anything. <laughs> so registration is also no longer required for things to be considered protected by copyright. So the absence of a copyright notice on something that you think you might want to use doesn't prove anything. It might still be copyrighted. Copyright notices are critical, critical in determining whether an older work might still be subject to copyright, though, depending on which version of the law it falls under when it was published. So under previous versions of the law, a publication without notice inserted a work into the public domain. So if you publish something before that became important or part of the law, then it automatically, that work went into the public domain and everybody could benefit from it. So it is still useful, though, to register new works with the Copyright Office um, because people who might be interested in licensing your work might want to know who to contact, first of all. Also, if you get into a situation where you feel like you want to actually pursue litigation, you have to have registered. So, just because copyright notice is no longer required and everything's considered copyrighted now, if you really want to make sure you protect your works, you still need to register them with the Copyright Office. And, last but not least, ownership of the physical object does not mean that you own the copyright. For instance, Say you're an institution and you have a collection of letters that were written in 1900 by somebody to somebody else. And they were given to you by that person's estate. 
if they have, if there's a deed of gift that gives you ownership of the copyright, then yes, you do it, indeed own the copyright to that item. However, if they did not, the person's estate may still own the copyright to that. And it depends on a lot of factors, whether, you know, when the person died, whether they actually gave copyright permission to somebody in their family, or, you know, they passed it on, or whatever. There's a lot of factors to think about. So just because you have it in your hand doesn't mean you own it. So how long does copyright last? Well, you might as well ask, what is the meaning of life? Because nobody really knows. <laughs> um, the duration of copyright protection, though, has been continually <coughs> expanding, getting longer and longer and longer. But technology is changing so quickly that copyright law is falling behind. The policy environment does not change as quickly. So that's why we have such a mess today. That's why we, we can't quite figure out so much, you know, what goes on. So four times here, the U.S. Congress has agreed that the term of copyright is too short. Too short. And they've extended it. <clears throat> so first in 1831 here, I don't know if you can see at the bottom of the screen there, it was 14 years in 1790. And then it went from, in 1831, to 28 years. 1909, it went to 56 years. 1976, it went to the life of the author plus 50 years. That's quite a big jump. <laughs> and currently, <clears throat> the lifetime of the author plus 70 years in 1998. And what happened in 1998 to, to bring this about? Andrew Bullen. Sonny Bono hit a tree. Yes. <laughs> Interestingly enough, this last extension of the Copyright Act, even though it's named after Sonny Bono, this was pushed by the Disney Corporation because Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck were coming into the public domain and my gosh, we don't want anybody out there making a porn film or doing something salacious with our characters, so we're going to extend that. And those are two of their biggest money makers. And here's the thing that really bothers me about this. This is from the company that has made, they've built an empire on the use of works in the public domain. Ah! Okay. So here's how I feel about that. It just makes me want to tear my hair out. I just don't understand. So here's the heart of the problem, as I said. Technology empowers us to do so much, but it gives, us the, it gives us the power to create lots of new works, but copyright law is lagging behind, way behind. So technology, as I said before, moves very rapidly, policy change, you know, just think about in your own institution when you're trying to change a policy, how long does that take? Well, imagine the U.S. government trying to change policy, and especially in terms of copyright, which is so convoluted anyway. Okay, so you say, but it's on the internet. Can I use it? Well, yes and no. After all, everything on the, on the internet is free, right? Mm -hmm. Well, no, no. The simple answer to that is no, it's really not. Um, internet access does not imply a lack of copyright protection, as I said. Before, I said, you know, everything on the internet is copyrighted because everything that's fixed in a tangible form now is considered protected by copyright. So, to make things even more interesting, of course, after 1989, they don't have to put a copyright notice out there. And copyright laws apply to both print and electronic materials, not just print. So, some copyrighted works might have been posted by the author out there without any, um, without permission, uh, I'm sorry, not by the author, but might have been put out there by somebody else without permission of the author. So maybe you link to that or you, you know, take things from that or what, you know, who knows what kind of trouble you could be getting yourselves into. So you have to be aware of these things. So the main thing here is that if we don't arm ourselves with knowledge about copyright laws, we're, we're really sunk. And so this makes it easy for us to infringe on the rights of others. 
Infringement is really easy to accomplish, as you all know, on the internet, because copy and paste just, you know, whoop, there we go, let's infringe today, right now, right this second. Okay. But copyright infringement is a violation of any of those, ex those five exclusive rights of the author. So, posting something on the internet is now considered publishing. So if an author publishes something, or you publish something from your project, that is considered copyrighted, whether you've done anything about that or not. And remember, that is one of those five exclusive rights, is publishing your work, or deciding when it's going to be published, if it's not published. So I want to remind you here that ignorance of the law is no excuse in court. Any, un any unauthorized use is an infringement, whether you intended it or not. Yes? So, if we have, um, using David's word, a member of the library, create original content, we film it, we put it on our database, and somehow somebody takes it to the web, mm -hmm. and they use it in, let's say, a non-PG rated way, <laughs> Do we have the right to sue? Okay, so I don't know if they, they could hear this question on the, on the video. So the question was, if somebody takes a, <clears throat> something that you, uh, a member of your, community. your, your community yeah. creates something that is new, new content, mm -hmm. and you put it, you make it available in your database, but it's not on the web particularly, but somebody else takes it and puts it on the web and makes some sort of salacious use of that or unauthorized use of that, can you sue them? Well, I think you can, but if you have registered that with the Copyright Office, you actually can get money for that. Yeah. I, I don't think you can actually get into a really litigious situation unless you've registered it with the Copyright Office. And I think that's kind of a drawn out process because I talked to somebody, I think the last cohort of I Lead You, I was talking to somebody who had uh, created a piece of music and she was trying to get it registered with the Copyright Office and, and had had it in the process for several months. But I think the fact that you actually have it in process might make a difference too. You know, so. I would say you probably want to register it with the Copyright Office, just to be on the safe side. Thank you. Again, consult your legal counsel, though, for real advice. <laughs> so here are some examples, as you all probably are aware, of how you can easily infringe. So using anything beyond the scope of what you have permission to, you know, you might have gotten permission for something, but if you go beyond whatever that is. Um, and here's the thing about creative works, uh, adapting an image without permission, making a derivative work. I want to show you an example of a derivative work here. This is from a famous case called Coons v. Art Rogers. The sculpture artist Jeff Coons, on the right here, this is his sculpture, lost this copyright infringement case because Art Rogers, who took the photograph on the left, notice that similarity? <laughs> and so he sued and he won for that. Because the artist asserted that it was, now, now Jeff here, the artist, asserted it was fair use to change a photograph into a three-dimensional work without obtaining a license for that. The court disagreed. <laughs> The court disagreed finding that substantial copyright elements were borrowed despite the change in medium. And you can see that it is very similar to that. So there was not enough. And this is, so see, this is a really subjective thing too. You know, this, there's no like, okay, well we've got to have like 10, 10 points here. Okay, so they, they only copied two. Okay, so that's really, that's fair use. But they copied all 10, that's not, you know. It's really up to the court. In cases of copyright infringement, the courts evaluate copyright infringement, <coughs> you know, pretty much on a case-by-case -case basis, just like they evaluate fair use. So, um, but we have.
have two very powerful friends in our corner. So in our quest to use works or portions of work of other people, we have the public domain and fair use. Now, and this is a great, this is a great little comic here, and they have a, uh, a Creative Commons license, and that's why I can use this and attribute that, and we'll talk about Creative Commons licensing later. Um, so let's talk about the public domain. Now the one thing that I can say for certain about the public domain is that most items that were published before 1923, and I say most, not all, are in the public domain. This image is from 1920, so it is in the public domain. I got this from an old magazine I found at the Illinois State Library. Isn't it lovely? <laughs> but published is the key word here. As unpublished works might not be in the public domain. The reason for that is, remember, publication is one of the rights of the author or the creator. And they have the right to decide when or if their works will be published. So at the end of this presentation, I, actually as I said before, I've included links to uh, some sites that are going to help you determine the copyright status of materials, which I think is really important. Um, so some of the things are, I have, a, I have a, the copyright slider from ALA, some of you may be familiar with that already. Uh, the Peter Hurdle chart entitled Copyright Term and the Public Domain in the United States is really helpful in determining what you might, how, how you can look at things, you know, whether it's published or unpublished and when it was published or when it wasn't, ha if it hasn't been published. And, you know, it, it kind of helps guide you through the convoluted um, copyright law that we have. Now, the, the duration of protection. So I have some public domain questions here. <coughs> People have asked me this before. Do you ever really need to seek permission to use a public domain work? Well, what do you think the answer for that is? Yes. No. no. <laughs> the public domain works are in the public domain. They are no longer protected by copyright. That's why, for instance, you see new editions of Moby Dick or Jane Austen novels or other 19th century novels that are no longer protected by copyright. Now, oftentimes you will see a copyright notice in those items, but they can't copyright the text of that book because the text is in the public domain. If they have added a preface or they've added the artwork on the cover or they've added notes or they've done other things, they can certainly copyright that. They cannot copyright that text itself because that can be used by any of you in any way. It's in the public domain. Did you, you answer my question? Okay. So other than things that have been published prior to 1923, mm -hmm. where do you go to find out what is in the public domain? So if you have a select work that you want to mm -hmm. do something with, where do you go to find out if it's in the public domain? Okay, so the question was, if you have a particular work and you want to know if it's really in the public domain, where do you go? The Peter Hurdle chart about copyright and the public domain in the United States, that's where I would start, right there. Because it is really, really easy to follow, easy to understand, because he has lists of whether it's published or unpublished, when was, when was it published, you know, all the different permutations of the copyright law. So I always recommend starting right there. And that's, again, that's in, at the end, I have that in the, in the, I've got a page of those kind of things, I've got a slide with them. So I, I've already answered this one, I guess. Um, it's legal, it is legal to publish public domain works and make money on their sale. Yes, it is. If copyright protection occurs immediately after work is fixed in a tangible medium, how can we put the work in the public domain? Does anybody know that? Creative Commons? Creative Commons is a good way. We can, we can publish it without, uh, with a notice that says, I'm giving this to the public domain. There are various ways that we can do that. Um, anyway, or putting a notice that says, I'm not claiming any copyright on this item. If a book is out of print, is it no longer protected by copyright? 
Anybody know the answer? Just no, shout it out. No, it's still protected. <laughs> it's still protected. Yes, that's right. You know, I think this is a really important point for librarians, especially to know because I've met so many librarians who didn't know that. <laughs> Scary. But again, copyright is not something that most librarians have to deal with in their everyday life. Let's face it. I never had to until I came here to UIS <coughs> as, a, as the head of the circulation department many years ago. And I was asked to develop an electronic reserves program, and I had to actually learn about copyright, which until that point had been completely Greek to me. And I thought, oh, dear God, what have I gotten myself into? But here I am today. I actually mm -hmm. have an understanding of copyright law. Maybe not as perfect as I'd like, but I still keep reading up on it. Okay, so let's go on to fair use. This is Dr. Kenneth Cruz. And he's my favorite expert in copyright law. And this is what he has to say about, cop about fair use. I completely agree. <laughs> it is elusive. It's ambiguous. It's vague. It's, it's just it's unbelievably vague. So you'll notice I have a photo credit here. And I, I contacted Dr. Cruz about this. And, and I thought, you know, I could call this fair use because this is a teaching situation and it's you know, but uh, so I talked to him about it, and he said, "Oh, you could definitely claim fair use on that, but if you want, you know, I do have the permission of the photographer to give permission to use these, so that's why I have that little little uh, credit there. No relation, photographer, no relation. <laughs> All right, so fair use. Fair use can be our big friend here, and it's codified in Title 17 in the U.S. Code, Section 107." Section 108 has things. I mean, you, some of this you might be familiar with because there's exemptions for libraries in this area. So many of you probably have familiarity with Section 108. But it's the doctrine of fair use is included in the Copyright Act of 1976, but it's based on actual practice in the court system. So fair use actually amounts to exercising a right, one of those five rights, remember, of the creator, without the permission of the copyright owner, without paying a fee, without signing a license. So fair use can be used as a defense in a case of copyright infringement. Often is, as we saw with Jeff Koons and Art Rogers, even though that seemed to me a little excessive. But it can also be used when some of the other exemptions don't apply. So it allows that copyright can be infringed because strict ap application of the law is stifling creativity. So you might be able to use a little, and again, I think that we should avoid letting the copyright law, just because we're afraid, we should avoid letting the copyright law strangle our creativity. I, I think that's what happens so many times with this. We get all bound up in that and say, oh, well, we don't infringe, so, you know, and that really is not good. Okay, so fair use applies for purposes like this, for scholarship, for research, and it is, it really is that balance between the rights of the copyright holder and the public's right to use that work. Remember, we want to promote the useful arts and sciences. We want to promote creativity and the betterment of the community. How better to do that than to use copyrighted works? Another um, part of the Copyright Act is the TEACH Act. Some of you may be familiar with this as well. This became law November 2nd, 2002, and this one, uh, it's worth mentioning here, although we're not going to really cover this, but it added a fair use exemption for educators, which is really great for me because I teach online. <laughs> so it really gives me flexibility to use things in my classes for my students. But it does permit the display and performance of virtually all types of works during online instruction, and I don't have to get the consent of the copyright owner. There's restrictions on it, of course. I, and, you know, I don't take anything wholesale. But again, this was really a nice uh, exemption for instructors. So how do we determine if our use of copyrighted material is actually fair use? Well, four factors are used to determine if your creative use of something can be considered fair use. Brian Tober made this picture for me. Isn't this lovely? 
he did this in Photoshop for me when we were working together at the State Library. And I, I found this old picture in, a ma in an old magazine at the State Library again. <laughs> and I just thought it was perfect. So we have these four factors, and we're going to talk about each one of these factors. So our first one is the purpose and character of the use. We have three areas to consider here. First, is our use of this copyrighted material primarily for nonprofit educational purposes? Or is it for commercial intent? We have to be very clear about what our intent is for that. Not every commercial use can be considered not to be fair use. And not every educational use can be considered fair use. So we have to kind of think about that. Um, but a preference for fair use will generally be granted by the courts in cases of educational and research kind of purposes. So these are the, specifically, the specific things that Section 107 mentions that you can do. You can use materials for fair use in these things. So another thing we want to think about is, does the, the new work create something new, or does it alter it by adding new meaning or a new message? to the original work? Does it have a different character or purpose than the original? You know, if it has a totally different character. Now, remember we were talking about that Jeff Koons and Art Rogers picture. Both of those are artworks. So they really have kind of a similar purpose. They have a similar character. So again, this is probably why the court said, it's a little too close for comfort there. So it's not fair use, Jeff. Now the scope of fair use widens a little bit with works of a factual nature, of course, informational works. Things that are uh, scholarship or news reporting, those kind of things. Both of those are, these are things that are primarily designed to inform and educate. So fair use kind of widens out a little bit and gives you a little more leeway there. Uh, the scope narrows though with creative works, as we saw, like fiction which is primarily designed to entertain people. And then remember that, again, I just want to stress this, one of those five rights is publication, and whether the item is published or unpublished. You know, if you have a series of, oh, who was the author? I saw, was it J.D. Salinger had given his papers to some university, and they decided they wanted to, I, and I'm, I, I apologize if this isn't the right author, but there was an author, a famous author, that I know you all know. And it, his name escapes me at the moment, but he had given his papers to a university, and they decided to do a little digitization, and... It was so It was, you know, those were unpublished, and he sued them over that. And I think he won, yeah. because they were unpublished. So, it does make a difference. So the courts have been less willing to uh, go for fair use when things haven't been published. We also have to, this, this refers to the amount and substantiality of the copying that you're doing in relation to the work as a whole. And again, remember, uh, that Jeff Koons example is so perfect because it was virtually a copy, just in, I mean, it really was, and the, the colors were different, it was slightly different, but it was basically a very recognizable copy of that photograph. So. We have to think about, is the amount more or more than what we need, more than what's necessary to achieve our purpose. We have to be careful about the quantity. We have to think about the quality of the material, you know. We have to think about the importance. Is it the heart of the item, you know. And this is very difficult when you are dealing with creative works, especially like fiction or artworks. What's the most important part of a photograph, for instance? <coughs> you know, if you if you have a picture of, you know, like Abraham Lincoln with somebody else, perhaps Abe in Springfield, of course, that might be the most important person in the photograph. And if you take that photograph and you say, okay, well I just want to use this this part of it, this Abe picture to illustrate something. Well that might be considered the heart of the photograph. And the creator might say, well, maybe the creator doesn't have any say now, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> he, might, he or she might be long dead, but nevertheless. <laughs> um, anyway, but that might be the heart of the item, and they might be considering that to be the most important thing. 
So we have to really think about that. And, and this is really important for creative works, especially, as I said. But in the end, of course, it all boils down to money, doesn't it? Really. What's the effect on the market for that work? What is the effect of your use? You know, when you think about going to court, claiming fair use, you know, this is where we have to think about, is our fair use going to have a negative impact on the sales of the original? Is the original still available to be sold, for one thing? Does it impact the marketability of that original work? Does it make the purchase of the original work unnecessary? And in cases of books or photographs or things like that, it might actually. You know, a, a digital facsimile of something might be a really good substitute and make the purchase of that item unnecessary. So we, we have to think about that. We don't want to have any damage. We don't want to cause any damage to the underlying work. Okay. So having looked at these four factors, let's keep this in mind. What can we say for certain here? An educational use is not automatically a fair use, nor is charging a fee to access it automatically unfair. All four of those factors have to be weighed in a court of law. All four of those factors. They're going to look at all four of them. And depending on the situation, though, some factors might weigh more heavily than others. In the terms of, again, I keep going back to the artwork, but in terms of artwork, those, those things might weigh more heavily than in terms of others. <coughs> um, so really, we're right back at the beginning because there are no clear-cut answers here. We have to kind of feel our way through fair use. But most decisions that you make to claim fair use, you, you just need to put together, you know, a little risk scenario and say, well, what's the risk for this? You know, if we do this, let's look at these four factors and let's weigh them. And generally, you know, well, fair use is really the thing that you would be using as a defense against somebody saying, you're infringing on my rights. But it is decided on a case-by-case -case basis in the courts. And that, again, is something that is really, uh, that makes a big difference, you know? Because we don't know, just because it was, you know, in the Jeff Koons case, that seems to me that's fairly obvious. But again, in another court, it might not have been. He, they, he might, the, the judge might have said, well, you know, it's fair use. So it's really hard to say that, and it's not, you can't codify it any further than to say these are the four factors we're going to look at. So section 107 is not meant to be specific. Instead, Congress actually did intend for this to happen, that it would be decided on a case by case. But in spite of this, though, I still think that fair use, uh, the fair use doctrine is one of the most important limitations on the exclusive rights of those copyright holders. But it does allow us to infringe on the rights. And I really implore you to actively exercise your right to fair use. Don't err on the side of extreme caution. And I say that <coughs> not as a lawyer. I say that as a person who really feels strongly that we should be out there creating things, and we should be able to use other things and make new things out of other works and our new works. And I really think that if we don't use fair use, we are going to lose it because it's always being battled against by somebody out there. Some author doesn't like it, and there's always somebody who's going to be out there saying, Fair use is bad. Fair use is bad. We gotta, we gotta keep fighting against that. We gotta get some of those rights back. So, always remember that. I, I actively encourage you. And again, just weigh those factors. Weigh those factors, and I think that you will find many times that your use can be a fair use, or even if you don't, maybe with a modification, it could be. So again, don't let the copyright law strangle your creativity. This quote is from a video that I have uh, listed on the final slide of this presentation. I don't know if any of you know who John Green is. He wrote this wonderful book called yeah. The Fault in Our Stars. 
It is my new favorite book of all time. My niece, who is 13, said to me, Aunt Alice, you have to read this book. And I did, and I fell in love with it. We bonded over this book. So anyway, this is, um, I encourage you to go to this website and view this clip. It's a three minute video. It will take you three minutes to watch it. And in this video, John Green recounts his attempt to discern the provenance of this poster, which I've pictured here, which is based on characters from his novel, and that's some text from his novel, one of my favorite little quotes. But this, this little video really reveals to you the complexities of copyright law in the digital world. Because, okay, so the text is from the book. This is from one artist. This is from someone else. And they actually, he, John Green talks about copyright a lot on his site. And between all, uh, among the, the, all the parties involved, John Green included, they have come up with a way to agree on how to use this. You know, I, I just think that's a wonderful thing that an author didn't go out there and say, they're infringing on my rights. No, he sought out these people and said, this is really cool what you're doing and I'd like to find a way that we can all cooperate on this. So not everybody is wanting to actually sue on this. Okay, so how can we avoid infringement? Of course, we have to assume it's copyrighted. That's the first thing. We have to review the sources of all of our materials when we're, when we're actually pulling them off the web or anything else that we're doing. Find out whether we need a license or, or some kind of permission to use it. And remember that using materials to create those derivative works, again, we have to get the permission from the copyright owner. Then we obtain those things. When in doubt, always get permission. Just like I did for that picture. Even though I was pretty sure I could find very used on that. But, and always give proper credit for your sources, as I have done here. I, I don't do this in all of my things that I, all, all of my lectures for my students online, but for something like this, since I know they're going to put this out somewhere in the public, I do. I always do. I think it's really important. Um, so what can we safely use? Well, most United States government materials, of course. <coughs> Some state government materials can be used. Facts that are found in copyrighted materials. If it's a fact, you can take it out of there and use it. Uh, materials or reprints of materials in the public domain. Um, as I said, remember that's the text of something, not the actual whole thing, you know, the, anything that they might have added. Um, things that are published prior to 1923, most of those things are in the public domain. A lot of things published between 1923 and 1963 are in the public domain if they have not had their copyright renewed. And you can look at the copyright renewal database to determine that. I think that's at Stanford. Um, and then uh, Project Gutenberg is an example of a place where you can get e-text free online. Um, I think to a large extent the Internet Archive, there's a lot of things there that are free of copyright restrictions as well. So there's a lot of things out there that you can use. So these are some sources for getting permissions for things, the places to find, how you can get permission if you, you know, if you need them. And if this slide didn't print very well, because I see it's in black and white there, uh, just, I can email you a copy of it, you know, that's a little clearer to see. I know it's easy to see here, but it might not be in your copies. But again, all right, so, if you're creating original content, how can you protect the works that you've created? Because if everything's automatically copyrighted, isn't that enough? Well, probably not. Even though registration is not a requirement for protection, the copyright law does provide several advantages that encourage copyright owners to register their works, as I said. 
Among these advantages are registration actually establishes a public record of your copyright claim, very important in, in a court of law. Before an infringement suit actually can be fired in, uh, filed uh, in court, it, for, for things that are of U.S. origin, you do need to have copyright registration. It's also necessary for getting money out of that, mm -hmm. <laughs> those statutory damages and attorney fees. Um, but registration also allows the owner of copyright to record the copyright with the U.S. Customs Service for protection against infringement uh, internationally. It makes it easier for you to enforce your, your rights in the international court. Now, the Internet makes it possible, though, for us to, you know, we have this sort of idea that everybody wants universal access. Yeah, that's great. Research, education, culture. But as you know, our copyright laws have not kept up with this and allowed us to realize this idea. <laughs> so, as I said earlier, technology moves at a lightning pace and policy at a snail's pace. So, um, we have something that's really interesting. We take for granted, you know, that we can all copy and paste and edit and post things to the web. Yeah, this is great. We can do this. But copyright was created long before the internet was even a gleam or a twinkle in the eye of Tim Berners-Lee. So it makes it difficult for us to legally perform those actions that we take for granted every day, that we do when we create documents or we create things in our, in our work lives or our personal lives. But whether you're an artist, you're a teacher, you're a librarian, or just a regular user, anybody, the default setting of copyright law requires us to have permission granted in advance to actually use those rights. So to achieve the, 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 this sort of vision of universal access, to provide a free, public, and standardized infrastructure that creates a balance between the reality of the internet and the reality of copyright laws, Creative Commons was developed. So I know that many of you have seen Creative Commons, but for those of you who haven't, this is kind of an interesting thing here. You know, uh, regular, traditional copyright laws are an all rights reserved sort of world. But Creative Commons provides us with 